How y'all doing tonight? Good deal. Anybody talk to their father last night? Anybody climb up in his lap and spend a little bit of time? Just checking. Hey, listen, you guys are good. Man, you are. I I mean, some of y'all were so kind. Hey, man, we really enjoyed it. Y'all are easy to preach to. I don't know what y'all been hearing here, but I think whoever preaches here on a regular basis has been plowing some pretty good ground. And it reminds me of a story. You mind if I tell you a story? I'd probably, uh, what? I'd probably been in Savannah for about five years, and uh, the church I pastor is probably 30, 35% African American. And pray for them. Many of those have not yet come back to church. And I'm really concerned. But anyhow, I was asked by one of the sisters in the church to participate in a funeral. Which I had always wanted to do that. And, you know, to you know, be able to preach to an African American. I mean, they talk back to you. And uh, you, you remember Lisa. And it was, uh, it was someone related to Bobby. And, you know, I was, went down to the country. And Lisa said, you're on the program. Now, it's a big deal to be on the program. And I had just uh, earned my doctorate, and the church had just made a big deal about that about a month before that, so she added that little title. So I show up to this little country church, and the the bishop, right reverend, pastor, whatever, had this big robe on. Young guy. He said, are you Dr. Porter? I said, yeah, I guess. And he said, it is so good to have you. All I was supposed to do is read a couple of verses in the Old Testament. That was my only job. Read a couple of verses. I figured I'd show up. I read my verses. Sit there, listen, and leave. Well, he said, now, stay outside. We're going to go inside. We always go in before the family. Family will follow us. And he was trying to explain it to me. So we get started, and I've never seen this before. This old boy started singing. On Jordan Story Banks, I stand. And, and, man, and, and he started singing, and he started moving. And everybody else was moving. Inside the church, they were sh- screaming and shouting, and tambourines and organs and pianos and everything. I said, this is going to be good. Now, I'm a white guy with no rhythm. And I said, this guy's swaying, the, the bishops and all behind me are swaying. I'm the only guy I'd like this. So I started doing my little thing like this, you know. And if Amber would have been there, she'd shot me, my daughter. You, Dad, you got white man's disease and you cannot dance. You ha- have no rhythm. So we make it up there to the platform. And, and I'm thinking, well, maybe the service will go. And this lady gets up there and reads a poem And brings the house down with the poem. This boy gets up and headed backwards. He was doing the New Testament. He got up and did the New Testament. It took him 15 minutes to read two verses because they were shouting at him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I said, look, I have not come here. Not to do my part the right way. I was doing Psalm 61. And I start off... (laughs) When your heart is overwhelmed, and it's, oh, yeah, that's right, our heart is overwhelmed. I said, isn't it? (laughs) I said, lead us. Oh, yeah, that's right, Pastor, lead us to a rock. (laughs) And then I stopped and said, you want to know who the rock is? The rock's Jesus, the one who walked on the water. Man, I went into about 20 minutes talking about Jesus. (laughs) Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. I got home that day, and, and of course, she, you, you know, when I finished, I went back and sat down, and, and they had these real high chairs with, with the high backs on them. I went back there, I sat next to the, the bishop, high reverend pastor guy, and said, man, that wasn't too bad, doc. I go, well, y'all led the way. I got home, and, and Tammy asked me about it, because Tammy couldn't go. 
I said, look, I did more work in eight or nine minutes of whatever I did, and I do every Sunday morning. I said, man, if I was a pastor of that church, they'd kill me. <laughs> and guys, I'm telling you that. Man, y'all are easy to preach to. And I thank God for your heart. And I had prayed for weeks now that he would open your heart up to hear about your father. Last night, we talked about the father's heart. Tonight, we want to talk about your heart. You see, the title is You and Your Personal Order. Prayer's Passion. I'm going to set this thing up tonight by going to the Old Testament and pulling out a picture for us. And just kind of bear with me. We'll spend a little bit of time setting this up. But once we get there, we'll put it in uh, overdrive. And we'll finish this thing up. But turn to Leviticus chapter number 8. Leviticus chapter number 8. You ought to have your Bibles. Don't get lazy and just rely on that crazy screen up there. And, and by the way, the guys up there are doing a great job. The good looking guys and, and the, the, the tech people and the music tonight. I just want to thank you guys for your investment. You're doing a great job. Leviticus chapter 6. And... Uh, Looking at verse number 8. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning. The fire on the altar shall be burning in it. Verse number 10. And the priest shall put on their linen garments, and their linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh. And take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments, and put on the other garments, and lay forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place." And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. And lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never burn go out. This is a great illustration out of the Old Testament. And it sets forth a basic principle. You you read these verses, there is an offering, there is an altar, there is instruction. The instruction basically, don't let the fire go out. The Old Testament, and, and if we had time, we'd go over to Hebrews and we could put all the dots together just Take my word for it, okay? But uh, all these in the Old Testament were types and pictures and shadows of great principles and truths that in the Old Testament points to the New Testament. There's a law in biblical interpretation which, which says it's the first principle or the first mention of something that's very important because if you look at it the first time, it gives us the great principle that God is trying to teach as he gives to us his truth in Scripture. So uh, we see that here. This advice and this command that is given to the priest teaches us some great truths that in our life, in our personal altar, the fire shall never go out. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 is is that great verse that, that... puts all those great things in the Old Testament and New Testament that, that now these things happen unto them. What God taught them, the laws that were given unto them, the, the events that took place for examples. And they are written for our admonition that we might learn from them, that we might be encouraged by them, that, that we might avoid what they did and do what God commanded them to do. 
It says, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Let's examine some of these truths for a few moments as we work our way to the application. The application is going to come real quick tonight, so just hang on there. First, the burnt offering was an offering displaying total surrender and consecration unto God. It, it, it was offered in the morning, it was offered in the evening, and it was completely consumed by the fire. And, and then during the day, an Israelite could come to show his devotion to God, and he would pick out the best that he had. He would bring it to, to the priest, and he would put it in the priest's hand to basically have it offered in his stead. A beautiful picture that I'm coming to God to give him my best. It is a place of surrender, a place where, where God told them he would meet with them. It carries with the thought of having that which is sacred set aside and consumed at the expense of the worshiper by the Lord. I'm going to try to behave myself and not get ahead of myself. Man, that, that'll preach, man. Leviticus 1, 8 and 9 kind of clarifies some of that. And the priest and Aaron's son shall lay the parts, the head, the fat, and order on the wood that is, on the fire which is upon the altar. But his inwards and legs shall he wash in the water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. See, see the thought was, as it burnt, and as that fat burnt, it, it, it created a smoke and an aroma that went upward as an act of worship to God. They worship God at this altar. Amen. Look at Leviticus 6, 9. Back, back to our text. Command Aaron and his son saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. It was called the, the burnt offering because there would always be a fire upon it. And, and it was important to understand that it was what the priests had offered in their stead and what they had brought and what the priest was doing constantly to keep the fire burning as a symbol to God that the nation of Israel, the people of Israel were totally consecrated to the Lord's service and to the Lord's work that they had been consumed by God's honor, God's glory, God's power, and God's presence. They held nothing back. That's what the place was for. Well, look in Leviticus 9, verse 24. God would accept the offering and the act of devotion by fire. Man, I, I would have liked to have been there. It says, and there came out, and there came a fire out before the Lord, or from the Lord, and consumed the altar in the burnt offering in the fat, which when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They had it laid out, and they had the offering. They were worshiping God. And God lit the fire on the altar. Yeah. Woo! And the people shouted. Yeah. Woo! Stay with yourself, Ro. We're trying to get there slow and methodical. Okay. God lit the fire. The people sold and shouted. The people worship God, and he got all the honor and all the glory. 
When there is fire on the altar of your life, God gets the glory and the honor. Amen. Well, it was a place of consecration. It was a place that, that God lit the fire. And once God lit it, they were responsible to keep the flame that God brought, the fire that God brought, to keep the fire burning on that altar. Woo, amen. All right. The priests were commanded by God to keep the fire burning and not to let it go out. We read this verse to you a couple of moments ago, but I want, I want to drive this point home. The fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. The priest shall burn wood in it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon, and it shall burn thereon the fat of a peace offering. And he said all the offerings that the people of God would go, they would offer in the morning, but that initial fire that fell on that altar and that flame came from God. And what they were called to do, continue to be totally surrendered to what God told them to do. Keep the fire burning. That point is driven home again in verse 13. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar, and it shall not go out. That's the backdrop. Now we get to talk about us a little bit. The burnt offering is and was a type of Christ. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10 says, we have an altar. And if you read that context there, he's talking about Christ and the sacrifice. Well, they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. He's talking about, about the old covenant. The new covenant is Jesus. Let me remind you of a couple of verses there. Over in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9, let me read it to you. It says, then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, talking about the first covenant, that he might establish the second, that's with Christ, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. God is calling his people for total, absolute devotion to them at the altar. Now, to put it together, as sons of our Heavenly Father, which we talked about last night, we must keep the fire burning on the altar of our heart. It implies to give. It implies to offer. It implies to yield. It implies to surrender. It implies that we hold nothing back, that we meet God at the altar of Jesus Christ in our heart. One of the great things that, that a lot of times we miss is that in the Old Testament, they were given a place to worship God. They were told about a tabernacle. You build the tabernacle, Moses, you do this, and I will meet you there. That's mentioned some 50-something times in the Pentateuch, that, that I will meet you there. He, he basically repeated the same thing to Solomon when Solomon built the temple. You build that temple, I'll meet you there. Well, we come into the New Testament. And you know what the temple is? He tells us, you are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit indwells you. Therefore, glorify God Worship God in your bodies which are not your own, for you are bought with a price. You want to know where the altar is? The altar is your heart. And who is the sacrifice? Jesus. Jesus paid the price that you can have access to God, that you and the Father can meet together and deal with your heart. 
And according to, to what the command is here, there will be fire in your heart, in your altar. Back in 1974, man, God lit a fire in my heart. Man, I've been doing the church thing, going to church. Man, they had good-looking girls there, so I was going to church for girls and, and to play ball and, and to do all kind of crazy stuff like that. But, but meanwhile, I was hearing all that stuff. I would sit in the youth class. We, we had about 175, 150, 175. I sat against the very back wall. I figured he couldn't get me back here. Man, that, uh, that holy whatever they're talking about, he won't get me here. And it's almost like that youth pastor every Sunday. Whap, whap, whap. And I took that for about a year. One Friday night after a revival meeting. I was laying on my bed and I said, Lord, I, I believe. All this stuff I've been hearing. Lord, uh, just save me. I know I, I'm a mess. I need you, God. And let me tell you, he lit a fire. Woo, man, he lit a fire. Man, all of a sudden, I want to get with God's people, Mark. All of a sudden, give me a Bible. And I didn't even, I didn't even know where to go in the Bible. I, I didn't know about God's people. But I wanted something because something was raging on in the side of me. God had lit a fire on my heart. And we are commanded to keep the fire burning. Let's walk through a little, little bit of this right now. The place of the fire was the altar. And as we said, it is our heart. It is the place where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit does its work and keeps the flame of the presence of God at work in my heart. Well, let me describe that place to you a little bit. It is a special place where God would meet with man in the Old Testament. You, you know what God is concerned about? He's concerned about your heart. He, I, I'm, you, you know, I'm sure he loves you and he's concerned about what kind of car you drive, but it's not a big deal to him. The big deal about God is, what's your heart like? Are you letting me love you? Are you receiving from me what I want to give to you. Are you spending time with me? See, God meets with us with our heart. I believe in the ecclesy. I believe in the church. I understand that dynamic of corporate worship. That is essential. That is important. And we ought to be a part of that. But listen, if you're not meeting with God on a personal level, you're no good when you come together and assemble together as a church. Amen, preacher. Number two, it was a place of devotion and sacrifice. It was a picture of total surrender. Number three, it was a place of confession where sin was dealt with in the heart. See, see, see we can fake our pastors out and the church out. We can go through all the motions. We learn the language. We learn the behavior. But when we get along with God at the altar of our heart, he reads us and it is a threatening thing. That's why prayer is a thing that most men are the most afraid of. You can't fake God out. But that's where confession is made. In the heart. Man, I guarantee you that this church is no different than my church. There's a thousand things that need to be done. But what's more important than you doing something religiously is you doing what you need to do. Get your heart right with God. Confess your sins. It was also a place of the supernatural presence of God. This is where the fire came 
See, uh, your heart and what Christ wants to do and what the Holy Spirit wants to do is the place where God shows up and shows out in your life. It's the heart. What was the purpose of the fire on the altar? Three things, real quick. It was to declare God's presence and his power. It was to demonstrate God's holiness. And it was to deliver praise and glory to God. Everywhere in in the Bible where you see fire, it represents the presence. It represents the power. And it represents the glory of God. And, and, And I could spend hours up here going through all that. Moses upon the mount. The pillar of fire for the nation of Israel. Uh, the, the covenant that Abraham made and, and, and the fire he saw. It, it, it all represents God's presence. If you want God's presence in your life, it has to be at the altar of your heart. Amen. It's also a picture of God's holiness. It demonstrates to us, as we worship him in the heart, what praise is. We can't praise him until our heart is what it ought to be. So that was the purpose of the fire on the altar. The third thing, the priests and their commands concerning the fire and the altar. And this is the application. We, we've made it there. Number one, or letter A, They were told to watch the fire. Make sure it doesn't go out. Some of y'all don't even know what the word percolate means, but I'm going to let that percolate for a minute. Here's a great question for you. Is there a fire raging in your heart for God? If there's not, then you have no passion for him. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it it are the issues of life. Psalms 26, 2. I taught this a few weeks ago. Examine me, O Lord. Prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Lord, deal with me at my heart. They were told to watch the fire. We we should watch our heart. Are we on fire for God in our heart? I'm not talking about what you're doing. I'm not talking about what you have. I'm talking about, and the test for this is you in Jesus, you and the Holy Spirit, you and the Father. If you're not spending time with him, then guess what? You don't have the fire raging and burning in your life. Okay, let me help you a little bit here. What causes the fire to go out? Well, preoccupation. When we are too busy to tend to the fire of our soul, the fire will go out. See, it's when our heart gets divided between everything. It's not that we're doing bad things. We're not doing the best thing. See, normally it's not perversion that will cause the fire to go out. What causes the fire to go out is preoccupation with everything else other than the fire and the altar in your heart. Number two, procrastination will cause the fire to go out. It is when we become too lazy to tend to the fire of our souls, the fire will go out. I believe you guys that are here tonight, you want the fire raging in your heart and your soul. But let me tell you, all you got to do is put off what you know you need to do about your life, about your sin, about what you ought to be doing, and the fire will quickly begin to go out. 
I'm out here in a part of the country where I know some of y'all have fireplaces. It don't take a whole lot for the fire to go out. You got to keep a keen watch on the fire. Number three, indifference. I love this one. Indifference will cause the fire to go out. It's when we, we, we don't care to tend to the fire anymore. We, we, act, we become empty and void of the desire of the warmth of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We become just indifferent to our heart altogether, and we just let our heart go. And it becomes cold toward God and cold toward his things. How about this one? How about pride? Man, I don't need a fire. I'm all right. I've learned this church deal. I can do church without fire. Yes, you can. You can do a lot of things around the church and not have fire. And that's what's wrong with a lot of our churches today. That's what's wrong with our families today. We got everything except the fire of God. Man, we got guys passing churches don't have fire. And what I mean about fire, I, I, I'm talking about holiness and a right, sweet fellowship and love between you and your Father. That's what sets you on fire for God. Amen. See, see, see the people I found, you know, pe- people, you know, and I think if you just shot one of these people in the foot, everybody else in the church would find out. I said, man, why did you get shot? Well, the pastor said I had pride in my life, man. I just didn't care about anything. I didn't think I needed anything. Man, just shoot one of them. Hey, man, I care about the church now. That wouldn't go over good, but you would get your point. But you know some of the hardest people in the world to reach are those saints who have come into the church, been in the church for a while. And and some of you silver-headed people, listen to me, I, I love you. But, but you're on dangerous ground sometimes because you're living way back there. Past fire won't work. Well, it's been said they have the furnace, but the fire's gone out. Don't do, don't do you any good to have a fireplace if you don't have fire. Don't do any good to have a heart and know God. You're not letting him put a blaze of his presence and his power and his promises in your life. Well, how do I know when the fire's gone out? I've got a couple of things. Down. I, I jotted these down the other day. Well, it's when you lose your passion for the Savior, you know your fire's gone out. Man, are you passionate about Jesus? Is he the one you talk about? I love Jesus with all my heart, with all my soul, and all my mind. See, there's no middle ground there. It's total surrender. Indifferent about Jesus. Not passionate about him. When you lose your hallelujah about your salvation. Woo! I I had a glorious time. Listen to Brother Mike talk about how he got saved. And he was getting excited about it too. And, and Mike's is kind of calm. He's about to get up and, and shout there in that restaurant. And man, man, I was over, I was loud. And, and the guy next door, or next table next over, stopped by and said, I heard y'all talking about God. I said, We were bragging. And I was saying to myself, Yeah, we were bragging about what God's done in Mike's life. I got a story to tell, and I haven't gotten over it. I was lost and I've been found. And if I get indifferent and apathetic about what he's done in my life, then I better bet I don't have any fire in here. Amen. Here's a good one. When you lose the desire for his word and for prayer, the fire is probably A hunger and a thirst for righteousness. A hunger and a thirst for righteousness. 
a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Whatever your hunger is will tell you what your God is. <laughs> when you lose your desire to be with the saints of God, <laughs> the fire has probably gone out. When you lose your focus on others and your focus is now on self, the fire is probably out. When you cease to minister to others, the fire has gone out. When you develop a critical spirit rather than a loving spirit, the fire's gone out. When you lose your compassion for the lost and your vision for the world, the fire has gone out. When you tolerate sin in your life, the fire has gone out. When you rather have the world than Jesus, the fire has gone out. Amen? Well, they were to watch the fire. Number two, they were told to take up the ashes daily and keep the fire fresh. This is where the real danger is, guys, especially for us who have been saved for any length of time at all. I tell you, when you get to a certain age, you begin to realize you have more years back here than you do here. You know, if you read the Bible, Bobby, you with me, buddy? If you read the Bible, there's only one day God ever talks about us today. Today, man. Renew yourself today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of the Lord. There, there's only one day that counts. It's today. What are you doing today in yielding yourself, knowing the Father, and making sure your heart odor is on fire for him because you're spending time with him? Today is the only day that matters. Don't, don't say, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next year, or I did it then. Today is the only day. They were told, take up those ashes, clean it up, and get it prepared for some fresh wood. Amen. Let her see. They were to feed the fire. The priests were to put wood on the fire. Now, that's not a hard thing. Unless the command is this, don't let the fire go out. Doesn't seem like that's hard, but don't let the fire go out. Just think about that. That's what you're called to do to guard your heart every day every moment because your heart determines everything and God is a rule and reign in our heart it took me years to understand that and I've been saved for years yet you know I, I thought well yeah if I could just be more motivated I could be more this and and, and I had it I, I was praying I was trying to follow God but but one day it dawned on me all he's concerned about is me in my heart just stop, bro, and spend time with me. I'll give you the strength to do all these other things you want to do. Remember the story of Martha and Mary? Mar I was Martha. I was always busy. I was always busy doing good things rather than the best thing. Was to sit at the feet of Jesus to make sure my fire would stay burning. I like what verse 13 says, the fire shall ever be burning on the altar. That's good stuff, man, that's good stuff. Now, what are some of the wood we can put on the altar? I'm going to give you a couple illustrations here. The wood of prayer. Probably the single greatest thing we can ever do is spend time with God. I, 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 
I asked, this, I asked God and the Spirit laid on my heart last night what I gave to you. And it wasn't easy for you to hear. It wasn't easy for me to say. But guys, you got to get over all this tradition stuff and realize God loves you. And quit listening to all the lies that you've heard your entire life. God loves you with a love that will never let you go. Spend time with him. And if you spend time with him, man, the fire rages. I, I, I could, and and w- wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't this be great to do? You, you got all kinds of companies today. When you walk in the door, they take your temperature. Here's a thought, Mark. Be able to take a spiritual temperature before we worship. We don't want you worshiping unless you're hot for God. We're going to take the temperature of your heart, man, if we had that ability to do that. Whoa, church, what change? Dwayne, where's Dwayne at? Worship beasts. Whoa. You get a bunch of hot people in here worshiping God. Man, flames in their, their being, man. That'd be great. Only prayer does that. I know in my life when things are waning, because I'm not spending time alone with God in prayer. Number two, the wood of the scriptures. Man, adding the word of God to your life. And, and all that works together, spending time with the Father. Uh, Father will lay on my heart some scripture. I'll read that scripture. Sometimes I'm reading scripture and I'm praying to. It's a combination of all that. The, the great thing is, the Father knows this book. I'm praying and all of a sudden something comes to my mind and, and I do this preaching thing pretty often and, and I'm looking for stuff to feed the congregation and I'm in the book, then, then all of a sudden, man, we, we're talking about this today, my, and all of a sudden you're reading scripture and there it is, whoa! That little thing I, I, I shared last night, Secretary came off and said, Pastor, are you okay? She thought maybe we'd be sued or something. Man, I was singing hallelujah, glory to God. Man, it's the truth that happens. See, isn't that good? We had the wood of God's assembly. Accountability and fellowship. We had the wood of Bible preaching and teaching where, where you, you stand uh, in, in a church service, you, uh, you worship God, and then the man of God gets up with God's word, and he lights fire to what you're, you're studying in the word of God, what God's revealing to you. God uses all that together to keep the flame roaring in your heart. That's what you got to have. Well, there's a price. There's a price. They had to forever keep the fire burning. The price of the fire on the altar, the fires shall ever be burning and never go out. Leviticus 6, 13. In order to keep the fire burning in your heart, the altar, where Christ, the Holy Spirit, and your Heavenly Father meets with you, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost time. That thing, time. Man, time to spend with the Father. To cry out, Papa God, it's... This thing I'm going through is bigger than me. I don't know what to do. And this is what the Father will do. He's good. He will remind you through the Holy Spirit that, son, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to lead the way for you. Man, that lights a fire within me. And and I'm able to get up off of my knees and know my God is alive. I can go to my father and climb up in his lap and say, Father, this battle, 
I'm about to give in, Lord. I, 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 I don't know what to do. And the Holy Spirit and the Son will remind me there is mercy, there is grace, and there is the power of God himself that resides in me. And it reminds me that greater is he who is within me than he that is in the world. And you want to believe that doesn't light a fire in this boy? You've got the same thing that I do. You've got the Holy Spirit of God. You belong to him. All you got to do is go spend time with the Father and let him set you ablaze for him. Woo! Your wife won't recognize you? Who is that guy? Man, I've never seen him like that before. You don't have to tell her that you are on fire for God. You don't have to tell her there's a fire raging in you. She will see the glow on your face like the nation of Israel saw the glow on Moses' face. That he had spent time with God. You cannot fake it. If you're spending time with God, the glow of the flame will be over you. That's what our churches need. That's what your family needs. What well, to God, that's what this country needs. Man, we get upset. God, help me not to make this turn. Lord, help me. We gripe and complain about politicians. It's not the politicians. The church a long time ago lost the flame. We compromised truth and, and, and we, we compromised Jesus and we got a lot of false fire out there. The real fire brings about holiness. The real fire brings about authentic love, authentic forgiveness. The real fire is willing to go the second and third and fourth mile for other people. Amen. I'd preach, man. Mm. It will cost you to keep the fire burning on the altar of your heart. Total surrender to the Father's will for your life. His way, not your way. Man, when I get off my knees, I know, hey, God is directing. I cannot fail. He has never failed me. He's never forsaken me. Jesus got a pretty good track record. One fantastic resume. Mm. Total honesty and humility in the sight of the flame of God. That's what it's going to cost you. We talked about that last night, transparency. You can't come to God and say, give me a quick fix, God, and just let me get out of here. Give me one, just give me a little match, Jesus. That's like what most of us want just enough God to make us feel legitimate, but not enough of him to make us be radical. That's what we need. Total faith in the Holy Spirit of God to say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself totally to you. I reckon myself dead, and I yield myself to you. I'm your vessel. Mm, mm, mm. Look at this final verse. Uh, it's already up very good deal. Guys are doing good. This is the great verse found in the book of Hebrews. This is in that, that final paragraph that the writer is putting together as he finishes out the book. He said, all this Old Testament stuff, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, what do we do now? Man, there's, there's not a tabernacle. Well, I've already explained, you are the temple. What should we do? By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of what? Praise to God what? Continuously. That's like keep the fire burning. Continuously go to him and praise him, honor him, give thanks. Go to your father, tell him I love you. Allow him to set you ablaze and keep the fire going by worshiping your God 
every single day, moment by moment by moment. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Mm. What does all that mean? We should be keepers of the fire. You know, if you're a husband here, you're called to God to be a priest to your family. You know what your family needs more than anything? is a flame of God from you that you got from God that you take back in that home. That's what your children need to see. Man, we got too much of this false fire. We've got too much of us and not enough of him. Let's put it together. I'm going to close. Last night, we looked to the Father's heart. That's what we need to know. You know what was in the Father's heart? You and me. Tonight, we've talked about our heart. What should be in our heart? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we totally concentrate ourselves to that, we'll have a fire that will rage and people will want to know, what is it about you? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, I thank you for all that you do. Lord, I, I thank you, Father, for these men who are so understanding, so patient. As we, we just try to give them the truth, we, we just try to share it with them. We, we ramble and we, we try to get it out. Lord, but I pray that tonight... Oh, Father God, that you would take it. Lord, for, for that man that has just, he's, he's just become cold. That you would bring him to a point that says, man, there's more than what I'm going through right now. I need more. I need more of Jesus. More of the Spirit. More of the Word. More of the Father. Lord, we just give to you right now our hearts. We give to you our praise. Teach us, God, what you want us to know about you. And draw us to you, Lord, that we might be on fire for you. Lord, burn away the apathy, the indifference, and give us a heart for the Father. I ask this in Christ's name. Mm -hmm.